Hey, what's going on, y'all? So heads up, just a little apology about my audio. So there's a lag on my end and a few words are lost here and there, but my guest Dion is crystal clear. She's the one talking all the good shit, so you aren't missing anything important. This week's episode is part two of a longer conversation. Last week, I had Dion, a clinical research associate with years of molecular biology experience, talk with me about the COVID-19 vaccine. We really, really got into a lot, but overall, part one does a really great job of laying down the foundation of viruses and vaccines so that this week's combo will make a lot more sense. Be sure to listen to part one, then dive into the continuation here. I made it around the world. taking the vaccine that was the question i started there okay so i got a maybe still on the fence nope you no so far it's a no for me dog um i got another no uh one of my my favorite answers so far was nah why take it first i'm not gonna be no lab rat appreciate you brother appreciate you got another nope i got one uh yes but not until it's been around and used for a year not flying anytime soon makes sense another nope hell to the not i got a yes i got a fuck no I got a, this is going to be hard for me because I don't even take the flu shot. Same sis, but it's looking like ultra. I think I got a nope and I work. Heck no, I'm not flying anywhere anytime soon. I got a no, but this one really surprised me just because it's UJ. Definitely. I think it should damn near be mandated. I don't believe in mandating things that go into people's bodies. Um, damn, I lied because I absolutely intend to vaccinate my future kids just because of science. I believe that there's a reason why science is science and that it's a thing. And I don't think that, um, you know, all of it is for fluff, but uh, yeah, this whole new shit is just a bit of a, so a couple of the questions that I got. Yeah. Um, some of your questions, some of you, some of the questions you've already answered. So I'm going to skip those. Um, I had, I was just okay. in the middle of asking you. So the, Vaccine that they are working on for COVID currently, um, it's just for COVID nineteen. It's just for the one strain, right? It's for yeah, it's for SARS COVID two. It is not for MERS, and it is not for SARS COVID one. Okay, and um, SARS one or two is just like the scientific name of saying what we know to be Corona. Just to be clear, right? Or for. Uh, COVID, yeah, like we it. know. Yep. COVID-19. Yep. COVID-19, mm-hmm. as we know, it is caused by SARS COVID-2. That's what we know is COVID-19. OK, so the vaccine is only going to protect against that one strain. Well, at least yes. that we would think of like, if there's the research team or something that's working on something that would possibly, I don't know, fit, uh, uh, protect against them different uh, COVID strains. Yeah. But- so. So the, one of the reasons why that is, is because sars COVID one never made it out of China. Remember okay. how like Hong Kong shut right, down right, right, quick? Right. They were able to, and that's the thing about like, when you look at islands, I had a friend of mine, my best friends, Megan, is in public health, and she did an internship in Taiwan, which is an island. And one of the things about islands and similar places is they have the ability to shut down differently and isolate populations because of that. And so Hong Kong shut down quickly and they were really able to keep it localized and got it under control, which is why they really, I mean, that's why it was it's still being studied, but it's not the mad dash race to find a vaccine um, because it's not what is considered to be a global pandemic. Um, I would like to, uh, I'm trying to figure out how controversial I'm trying to be tonight. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um one thing I will say, though, as it relates to the United States, so there are some conversations about why the term pandemic is not the right term for the United States specifically. Mm-hmm. The term some people you'll see use is called syndemic. Okay. Syndemic has to do more with the fact that our state of health, again, generalizing for the United States, we're not nearly as healthy as we think we are. 
which is one of the reasons why we're seeing some of the responses to the virus as like population wise as compared to other parts of the world. So some people call that a syndemic because it has more to do with the baseline of health and comorbidities of a place more so than a virus itself. Um, and I do think that's an important distinction or just note to make um, leading into my next statement as just COVID-19 in America, because I'm an American, um, just in general, I know a lot of people have a lot of questions about vaccines, a lot of hesitancy about vaccines. My goal is not to tell somebody what to do because I can't. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a PhD researcher, nor am I want to ever pretend to be. And the answer will be different for different people depending on their current circumstances as individuals and their lifestyle and who they live with. I do want people though to hear me when I say this. Whether you get a vaccine or not, it's not going to protect you from being exposed to COVID-19. You just get to determine how you get exposed and what you potentially get to experience. I hear a lot of people say, well, everybody's not dying. And you're right, everybody is not dying. And right now it's been pretty unpredictable, you know, with who is and who isn't. But I want, what I want people to remember though is for every person that's not dying, there's still now people saddled with thousands of dollars, tens of thousands of dollars of medical bills that can't pay for. Um, there's a lot about the long-term effects of going through COVID-19 that we don't know yet. We've seen healthy women who just ran marathons now need a lung transplant in their 30s. We've seen people who their scans make it look like they had vascular disease for the past 10 years. In the same way, we've seen people who got a stuffy nose, got a headache for a couple of days. And other than that, you know, it's, it's, it's back to business for them. The unpredictability is what me, Dion, as an individual, I personally am not comfortable with. It's the unpredictability because I don't have any way of guaranteeing that I will be the one who gets less of an issue than someone else. And we don't know long-term effects afterwards. So I know there's a lot of concern about, well, if I do a vaccine, right? One of the first generation vaccines, mm -hmm. what if we find out a couple of years later, it's associated with such and such, right? Great question, great question. But just remember not having the vaccine and going through a COVID-19 infection doesn't change the result of you're going to then experience effects of an illness, possibly years after the fact that you don't know either. So again, the answer will be different for different people. My niece is running around, but I just want people to remember that the end result is still the same in terms of uncertainty and questions. And I think that's important to remember if you have children, it's important to remember if you were around older people in your life, you know? My mom and my dad, my dad is 70. My mom is in her, you know, late 60s. I have my three-year-old niece running around here right now with me. Um, so for me personally, my decision is actually more motivated for them than it is me and the confidence I have, you know, in my current situation. But just remember that people in general are not nearly as healthy as they think we are, um, especially in America, the land of comorbidity, right. the land of pre-diabetes, the land of type 2 diabetes, the land of asthma, the land of all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And that impacts greatly how people are going to experience this illness. There's a lot of data right now that is published from people who are treating people with COVID-19. This is, and when I say treating, I mean this observational data. People okay. who are metabolically healthy are, are usually able to survive this. Mm -hmm. So when I say metabolically healthy, I'm talking about people who are not type 2 diabetic, people who are not pre-diabetic. And a lot of people say, well, I'm healthy or I'm not overweight, so it's not me. If you haven't had a fasting glucose and an A1C and a glucose tolerance test in the past year, you don't know that. Mm -hmm. You don't, you know, you don't know that. Um, and our population is black people, black women, black men, um, other populations of color. 
we all know I don't need to beat us over the head with our access to care, how we tend to get poor quality care, even when we right. spend in the same money, you know, going into medical places. So, so it puts us at um, a higher risk to experience certain negative effects because we do not have the cushion, right, and the safety net that some other people have. So when right. people are making this decision, I just want people to remember, I'm not saying go get vaccinated. I have my own personally i'm just taking my like work hat off as an individual i plan on getting vaccinated but i have my eye on the program that i'm kind of hedging my bets on and -hmm. they haven't published anything yet so i'm waiting to find out what's going on but i just want people to remember if you don't want to get vaccinated cool but don't think that not getting vaccinated protects you from unknown long-term side effects because it doesn't Mm -hmm. So you it would does, have to it be protect you. basically, and sh- you would, so in o- in a sense, in an essence, you would in the um, the scope of not getting the vaccine, you're basically saying you are relegating yourself to a life of continuing to um continue not just to mask up, but to also just be overly cautious in your uh, to get it. Because either and, way, and the thing is this, right. yeah. And the thing is this: it's a virus. Listen, mm-hmm. virus has been around before we before we walk. They're gonna be around long after we gone. Like they're like they win. <laughs> yeah. We all eventually will be exposed to it. I mean, I mean that. I mean that. But that's the nature of what they are. Let's remember, right. they're trying to be the key to unlock them all. That's the nature of what they are. What I'm saying is, I'm gonna put it like this: people. Take a, just take a private moment to get really honest with your current health state. Mm-hmm. And really what your baseline is, what your lifestyle is. A lot of people work some very stressful jobs, especially now. You got poor quality sleep, barely getting sleep, depending on things to help you relax. Do you have access to high quality food right now? You know, I'm eating Chick-fil-A sometimes just from stress yeah. <laughs> and the comfort of wanting some, some nuggets and fries. So I'm just saying, just be really honest right now with yourself and your health and not just your health, but also your circle and people who are around you. Most of us are not as healthy as we think we are. Mm-hmm. And for all the talk of, oh, you know, I want to fight it off naturally. That's cool. But remember this about your immune system. Your immune system fights and in the, in the process of fighting, it'll burn the forest down, which means you. Your immune system doesn't have an off switch for self-preservation. That's why autoimmune disease exists. It's fighting itself, right? Mm-hmm. So when people say, oh, I'll just fight it off, we live in a land, especially in 2020, all of us who can hear me and myself talking included, we are products of a certain privilege. And that privilege is we don't see people in America, right, around us who are physically disfigured from polio. We don't see people who lost their hearing and lost their sight from measles and the mumps. Mm -hmm. We don't go to cemeteries anymore and put flowers on 18 bassinets made of concrete, right? With all our baby cousins who all died before they were six months old from dysentery. Mm -hmm. We've been very removed for a long time with what massive viral infection and the side effects look like. If people have grandparents that are alive who were born in the 40s and 50s and the 30s, talk to your grandparents. They know the time where people had 15 kids, not just because they were living in the South, you know, working the farms, but because only seven of them were gonna make it. Right. So I just want people to remember, no matter what decision you make, because you have to make your own decisions for yourself, But I want people to remember that either way it goes, you're not necessarily protected from an unknown. We're seeing people who went through COVID-19 again, and they're fine, right? They're back Mm -hmm. at the gym. Their life has gone on. But we've also seen some very healthy people, you know, physically, you know, they look healthy. They were doing what healthy people do ahead of time. And they eat lung transplants. So they're dealing with now the effects of chronic fatigue syndrome right? Where they can't work anymore. I personally have to just decide which risk am I willing to take? 
and what can I think I can deal with after the fact. And again, the danger with this is the incubation period is so long. It's a respiratory virus. So it's so easily transmitted because we all have to breathe. Right. And so while people say, well, the mortality rate isn't that high, people are overreacting. The cost of healthcare, though, is not just about who died. Okay, get on the in, get 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 intubated and survive. You got a sixty thousand dollar medical bill now. How many of us really have the proper short term disability insurances? How many of us truly have a true emergency fund of a year of living expenses? I know I don't. Right. right. So just remember all of those things when you're making your decision about what you're doing. You got a life insurance policy. You know what I mean? Set up. Some people got GoFundMe's now because they can't afford to bury people. Yeah. Another thing so, to, um, to just, rem- yeah. is similar to what you said of um, access to care. Your doctors are people the same way I look at these cops like they ain't got no sense or any regard. For life. Imagine putting yourself in there somebody that shit about you because you can go to these hospitals, these doctors office to these clinics and they'll just tell you, oh, OK, you know, it's not bad enough. Well, yep. okay, yeah, it is bad enough and you're here. And then they have to make the decision between A, person yep. B, and you. And yep. so even yes. if you do have a good chance of survival or if you feel you're young and you were worth being saved, somebody else may not see it that way. And Absolutely. Uh, that's the sad bit, is and that once listen, you're in- It, it is. The it situation, is. you and, don't and have to, control. And to your point, you don't. And to your point, we're already seeing stories of that even amongst white people who are just poor. Yeah. Right? We, we, we're already seeing stories of that, especially in some of these other countries, um, not countries, states, that have a very high positivity rate. I think the positivity rate in Wyoming is like 64%. Mm-hmm. Wyoming don't have no healthcare, healthcare. Like I live in North Carolina. We got Duke, Chapel Hill. The city I live in has two hospitals. I can get to Chapel Hill in 45 minutes. I am lucky. Right? Minutes Majority of the population doesn't have access. You know, majority of the population doesn't have access to that. And you're right. Once you get into a certain situation, decisions get made that you're not in control of. Right. Mm-hmm. And healthcare workers are, are dying. Yeah. You know, they're, they're dying, too. So do I think that sometimes some of the death statistics are, are framed a certain way? I do. Yeah, I do. Um, do I think that this is a real thing that poses a risk? Yes, it does. Mm-hmm. I encourage everybody, regardless of your stance on vaccines, let me say this too. The, the, the effectiveness of a vaccine on an individual level is a testament to your health. People who are metabolically and physically fit, who get vaccinated, tend to have more positive results of a vaccine. If you already have a compromised immune system, some people got childhood illnesses they had no control over and they have a compromised immune system, right? Mm -hmm. Some people have asthma, some people have diabetes and and not a diabetes that they can diet themselves out of, whatever. Those things do put people at risk. Um, Cancer, you know, you might not have cancer, but what if if your best friend though, her little girl's fighting leukemia? What about that? So it's just important when you're making these decisions these are public health decisions that are come down to individual. And we have an obligation to protect ourselves, protect our loved ones, and as an extension, other people. So if you don't want to be vaccinated, okay, then put in other things on a day-to-day basis to also give yourself the best possible immune system to be able to survive. We're going into the fall and the winter. The days get short, right? Mm-hmm. Get the outside time you can get in. Take some supplemental vitamin D with K2. Make sure it got K2 with it. Get some exercise. If you got to throw on tie bow on the YouTube, something. But all of those things are important to maintaining a, a level of health and vitality. But I just see a lot of people on Instagram, some of my own personal friends, like y'all are rolling up weed and eating edibles, talking about you're not getting vaccinated. And it's like, bruh, I know for a fact you got asthma. <laughs> Come on now. Sorry, fam. <laughs> like, let's, I'm just saying. Right. You know what I'm saying? I'm just keeping it real. Like, mm-hmm. come on. You said, I can't breathe in the mask. If you struggle to breathe in the mask, that's already a sign that you're dealing with something. If you can't breathe in the mask, how are you going to breathe with COVID-19? Right. You're not guaranteed to be asymptomatic. I would hope I would, would be because I don't want to be sick. But nobody is guaranteed anything. We're not. And that's the reason why the airline is making it mandatory. It's a respiratory virus where you're sitting on an airplane and it's a respiratory virus with a long incubation period. 
So let's say there's someone, let's say me and you both about to hit Australia up, right? We about to go to Perth. We were on that flight and me and you were fine. But the guy sitting in front of us was exposed two days ago. He's fine. He could be spreading it to the entire plane. We're going to get all for our 14 day excursion through, through Australia, right? Mm -hmm. We just spreading it all through Australia. We're not going to show that we're really sick if we get sick, right? Until we're on our way home. Right. That's the reason, that's the reason why they probably decided to make it mandated. This incubation period is crazy. So we already know that with all viruses, go ahead. Is that the difference between a regular flu and COVID that there's, I guess, a longer incubation period? Because like with the flu, you know, you have to mean like by day two of it, like you get the flu and then maybe two days or so after the flu, you know, you have the flu so you can kind of keep it to yourself. The chances of you being at many people. Right is a little bit lower. So I guess the transmission rate would be lower, but with, uh, and that's another thing about, I guess that leads me also to my next question with the, the testing. Do you feel like the testing is even done adequately or appropriately only because I know one of my grandmas ended up with COVID, not a sniffle, not not a body ache, nothing. And she's got a shit ton of, you know, Mm pre-existing conditions. We only mm-hmm. found out she had it because she went and got, to, she was doing like um something in the hospital, like a, son, a sonogram or a Doppler or something on her legs. So they just mm-hmm. took the test because they were doing another procedure. That being said, found out and was like, oh shit, didn't even know. So, you know. They didn't know. Yep. Right. Didn't know, never had a right. symptom, never had a sniffle or cough. Thank God right. she stayed asymptomatic. And that was the fear is that, okay, she's fine today. What about tomorrow? She's fine today. What about tomorrow? Because I didn't know how long she was going to be fine. And she ended up continuing right. to be fine. But, um, you know, I know that there are other things that may um, come as a result of the line, possibly, um, you know, that you may not initially have attributed to, but you know, now that right. she's had it, it, you never know how it can present. And that's kind of now, you know, the, in the back of my head. That, thing. That's, that's the thing that's scary. I have a friend of mine who went and got tested because he was going to go out of the country to Columbia. So, you know, you get tested before you go. And mm-hmm. that's when he found that he had it. Nothing wrong. Right. Nothing wrong. No fever. You know, no, no body ache. No nothing. Um, it's, it's unpredictable. That incubation period is, for me, is what makes me so uncomfortable because it is such a long period of time. So and the you 14 could be days, fine and you viral shedding. The 14 like days it, is the incubation. They, they're saying 10 on average, but we're seeing people who don't get sick until it's 14 or 28 on, on like these one-offs, you know? I don't believe, like me personally, I don't believe in exceptions. So I try to always know what I'm dealing with as far as the whole scope. Um, but that's the part for me that's like, it's, it's, it's wild, right? It really just varies so much and you don't know. Um, but to your point about testing, personally, I felt like testing was fumbled early. So for example, so when the f- whole thing first started as far as lockdown, to me, that was the time to roll out mass testing because you need to get an idea of how it's spread in the population. And that was the time to find out who's already bumped into this thing and just did not know it. Okay. Right. We needed to know that. But that's when we had 45 with that whole sending people the equipment, but no reagent and all of this other mess. But that was the time to mass test everybody. And that's what you saw being done in other countries. Like in Korea, they had a the little booth, you know, you walk up, swab, 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 but everybody needed to get tested because the more people you get test on the front end, the more you can get an idea of what's already happened and the trends of how it's moving through a population. We didn't do that. Okay. And so we, we lost all of that time for data and being able to put people in more strategic isolation Mm -hmm. because the downside of lockdowns from a health perspective is this. Sometimes some of the very same activities you need to have access to do for a robust physicality in mental space, because we can't underestimate the mental effects of what people are going through with different levels of isolation, they can be just as damaging, if not more damaging than COVID-19 itself. We can't, we can't not say that. But in the lockdown, some of those things that people need for overall health, they're not able to do. The gym is closed. Well, having space to physically move your body and get all of those physical 
effects outside of trying to lose weight, but just the process of moving your body and your muscles that has a regenerative effect to the body, right? Mm -hmm. People aren't able to do that. People have less contact with outside getting fresh air and sunlight. We're human beings. We evolved outside in the sun and nature and next to fire. That is important for our mental and physical well-being. So that's the downside of lockdowns, which is why you will find some arguments about against lockdowns in the in the the way that we've done them, mm-hmm. um, which I can't I can't disagree with. They make very valid points, and that was why I always said we really kind of dropped the ball with testing because we needed mass testing to be very strategic. So people who were at lower risk for some of the side effects could still have contact, you know, more increased contact and friction with the outside world in an effort to maintain certain baselines of health. Um, One of the arguments that people might see if they kind of look up the whole syndemic thing is as a country, we still have a daily allowance on the food pyramid for a certain amount of sugar, which we all know sugar is like one of the worst things you can consume. So it's kind of like on one hand, you say we're doing these things to help protect health, but unless we change the USDA food pyramid while we add it to get people off of processed food, it kind of almost seems like that's the oh, root like. cause of why some conditions we have at the increased rate anyway. So it's kind of like, you know, like kind of like, yeah, how much do you mean this? Right. Which I think are all great places for discussion, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, as we move forward and the world continues to change, like COVID-19 is the tip of the iceberg was out there. I'm not trying to like scare people, but I want people to know like across the world in all countries, there are scientists and different groups of people who their job, their life's work is finding the most nasty, deadly, pathogenic viruses and bacteria and trying to learn them and study them so that if they ever decide that they want to test around with unlocking humans, we have some kind of defense against those. And they, those rates of transmission from, you know, animal over here to us are going to continue to increase over time. It's not going to decrease. So this is all of opportunity for us to reinvest time into ourselves and our health, to prepare ourselves mentally and emotionally, to work on bad habits that we know we all have. Look, we all right. know what our bad habits are. And to get real realistic and real honest with really your baseline of health you know, physical health, emotional health, and financial health, because surviving something is one thing. Can you afford it? Y'all know the country we live in right. and how expensive healthcare already is, you know? So you got people who are, yeah, they're getting out of the hospital, but they got $60,000 of debt now. So the cost is not as simple as, well, only this percentage of people die. The medical cost, though, of keeping people from dying is astronomical. Yeah. So the next question is, do you have COVID? That's the question. You like, I don't I mean, got Maldives that, money. Maldives ain't for me because I ain't got the bread for it. <laughs> I don't got COVID money either. I ain't you know, you. I mean, <laughs> that's it. This shit high. We, most of us barely got money for the life we got. And we're trying to, you know, <laughs> right. hold on to a little piece of that. No, I mean, I mean, it's, I mean, it's expensive. Mm-hmm. It's expensive. Uh, some other, ch- and some other cheap things people can do. And people can look this up and they'll see the data that I'm referring to, um, melatonin. So some people say, well, how come some people, you know, get sick? Your grandma, right? Didn't even know she was sick. Then you get some people get exposed to COVID. And then like two days later, we on a ventilator, right? Right. What, what is making that reaction so extreme in some people? So you'll see people refer to it as a cyto- cytokine storm. Cytokines are signaling molecules we have in our body that are related to immune systems. And for some people, they kind of go into overdrive. Like they, they just go zero to 100 real quick. You know what I mean? Like we had an argument and now you already at the car busting out the windows. It's like, right. like, babe, calm down, right? And for some people, that reaction is so strong and that reaction causes them to escalate so quickly into needing medical intervention. Mm. One of the cheap things you can do to lessen the likelihood of you stirring up into a cytokine storm if you if you do get exposed is melatonin. It's one of the cheap things you can do that helps prevent that escalation in symptoms. If people want to read this, if they just Google melatonin and COVID-19, 
they will see some people much smarter than me explaining it in detail on how it works. My thought is this, melatonin is found at every store, you know, even to the dollar store, you can find a little melatonin, right? Mm -hmm. We know melatonin is safe to take as far as overdosing. Like we don't really have documented overdoses of melatonin, right? Mm -hmm. So I rather hedge my bets of if I do get exposed, if this $5 a month can help prevent me from needing a ventilator and let me ride this out in my home, you know, right. with some food right. and some Gatorade and some meds, I'm just spending the extra five to pop a little extra melatonin at night, right? Small, small thing, but that's, that's something I can do. If you're a type two diabetic or have another condition that you take metformin for, you'll see a lot of data that people who take metformin also are able to survive this this um, virus at higher rates and it has to do with that metabolic part of metabolic fitness and met, um, metformin helps okay. with that um, so people can people will see that data as well and this data is coming from observations of people treating COVID-19 mm -hmm. um, patients you know observing who was taking what this is where that data comes from but you'll start to see a lot of that if people start looking now they'll see it not just in America but in other countries as well as it relates to metformin but the melatonin thing for me, I'm like, look, $5, worst case scenario, it don't do nothing, right? Worst right. case, I wasted $5. But best case scenario is if it can help prevent me from getting on an intubator, because that is what is really determining who survives or not. The longer you can stay off ventilation, mm -hmm. the better the better off you can be, right? My goal is if I get sick, I want to be able to just hold myself up in my room, have right. my bro brother drop off some Thai food, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, hit the door dash something and be able to ride it out at home and get to the other side of it successfully. That's my goal. So if the five dollar melatonin can help me do that, I'll hitch my bets and take it. Worst case scenario, it'll do nothing. But five dollars is a small price to pay to possibly prevent a ventilator. And you said it was um vitamin D with K in it. Was it was it K2? Or vitamin D it? with K2. Oh, I'm thinking K2. So K so K2 crazy stuff. They were taking, they were smoking the, the K2 in it and, went, ah, and other zombie drug. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no. don't take no. that so vitamin don't do that K2, um vitamin no <laughs> <laughs> so vitamin k um you know people see vitamin k and leafy greens and all of that vitamin k2 though is the version that our body recognizes more easily and it comes from animal-based products or fermented products okay. um, for people who are who are vegetarian or vegan there are Kombucha vegan kind of sources thing, right? of vitamin k2 um they come like from soy it's, it's called i think it's called natto it's n-a-t-t-o it's a fermented japanese kind of product and that's where they can get okay. the k2 from but it's important to if you take vitamin d3 it's important to get enough vitamin k2 because it allows for the vitamin d to do what it actually needs to do um and it's cheap you know you don't have to spend a ton of money on this mm -hmm. at all you don't have to spend a ton of money on this the data as far as vitamin k2 the benefits of the k2 version um, again, are well published. All people need to do is hit PubMed, put in vitamin K2, and you'll see a lot of research that you can go through, you know, on your own time. What but was that, what was if that you're link again? Take the vitamin D. So PubMed is one of those search engines and websites you can use to pull up um, scholarly, more mm -hmm. scholarly data. Um, and you can usually get access to like the full report on, uh, on PubMed for free. And that's but, um, com, if you're right? going to take the vitamin D, I think it's dot com. If you if they okay. Google PubMed, it will come. It'll up. pop up. Okay. But if you're gonna take the vitamin, yeah. If you're gonna take the vitamin D, um, the vitamin D three, just get you some with K two in it. It doesn't cost any extra. Mm -hmm. um, but vitamin D has been shown to help people um, through respiratory distress, whether it's okay. bacterial or viral. Um, and that data, if people want to take a look at that, they'll also find it in a similar place. Um, it's not saying that vitamin D on its own is going to prevent a respiratory infection. What the data shows is people who take supplemental vitamin D and have higher vitamin D levels tend to get through these things better than people who don't. I want to make that gotcha. clarification. It's not a preventative. Right. Um, again, for something that should cost a couple of dollars a month, I'll hedge my bets and just get me a little bottle of something, you know, and take mm -hmm. a pill every day just to hedge my bets, especially because it's getting dark outside and we make vitamin D in the sunlight and we make it from UVB rays. And if you're nicely melanated, like both of us are, you make it at a slower rate because 
you know, we're, we're, mel- we're, we're melanated people and we evolve closer to the equator. So, you know, right. this is one of the things I just like to take in the fall and winter time, especially for mood too. Seasonal depression is a thing. That's not going to oh, help your anxieties as it relates. So it'll, yeah, it can help for with For some that? people, for some people, again, for some people it helps with that. I also have one of those little UV lights at my desk for the same reason. Um, again, people can try it out. And if it helps you, it helps you. If it doesn't, it usually isn't going to hurt you. You know, if you want to run it by your doctor, of course, cool. Um, but for me, I try to think about what things are affordable and cheap, mm-hmm. low risk of side effect, yeah. but high potential reward. And I hedge my bet from those. Um, so that's why I take the extra melatonin and the vitamin D3 in the wintertime. You know, worst case scenario, I wasted twenty dollars. I wasted twenty dollars right. on less. So, <laughs> same. I can drink okay. twenty dollars before before my 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 dinner even get to me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, um. So those, but those kind of things. So you know, regardless of what people want to do, I want everybody to be encouraged to mm-hmm. continue to stay in tune, continue to ask questions, um. It can be a scary time, especially because we know how news is often presented. Um, People's anxieties, you know, are always going to be ratcheted up, especially right now. So, you know, don't be afraid to unplug, relax, get some sunshine. Mm -hmm. I'm not a fan of you don't get to live your life. But just remember, you're trying to also have life to live this time next year. So, you know, you need to just plan for for the long haul for preservation there's i think there's i think people can still do a little bit of what they want there's just smarter ways to move through certain things right now Mm -hmm. um because it's always fun and games until you're the one that's sick and you're the one really going through it yeah like i don't want to i just i don't want to i don't want to be like yeah girl i'm fine and i'm the one out of everybody who end up (laughs) right (laughs) like what happened to her like girl I mean, to be you know, the one to go so. to everybody else because essentially considering the intubation period is it possible that say for example i come in on monday i'm near a co-worker that is covid pop this co-worker monday and i get but i don't know I have covid i want to go to uh, a party on thanksgiving so i had to go get tested on wednesday so i get tested mm-hmm. wednesday to party on day is it possible that it doesn't show that like yes. does my test so people yes, and that's eight hour lines for these COVID tests to go travel and be about yeah. and run freely. Is it a good idea? Right. And so, and you know, I'll say that I'm lucky in the fact that most of my family lives near me and I know everybody doesn't have that luxury. Right. Mm-hmm. So I see them all the time. So if you're in a situation where you don't get to see people and it's really weighing on you, I understand the, no, I really need to see my people. Getting yeah. tested beforehand is still is better than not being tested. We just yes. got to remember if there's a thousand people being tested and 500 of them are negative, right? Mm-hmm. Statistically, all the 500 ain't going to be negative Thanksgiving morning. That's all I'm saying. And now you're sitting next to your uncle with type 2 diabetes. You're sitting mm-hmm. across from auntie who just went through cancer treatment. Mm-hmm. You might be fine. They might not be. Right. So it's just, we just got to remember statistically, all that 500 is not going to be negative Thanksgiving morning. Right. And that's, that's all I'm saying. The, that's, and I'm all, that's reality. That, that, and that's, and that's the conundrum. It is. Again, I never want to say somebody, I can't believe you going. Cause I, cause I understand. Cause yep. I do understand that I'm very lucky right now with my family around me all the time. And everybody does not have that luxury. So mm-hmm. I totally understand that. Um, but the reason why people are keep harping about certain precautions is because of that. So yes, it's better to get tested than not. Absolutely. Just remember everybody who tested negative on Wednesday or Tuesday, is not going to be negative on Thursday. Right. And also because you run the risk of yep. like you take the test on Tuesday and then you walk out, you still do everything that would be in the normal scope of what you're yep. going to do come Tuesday. So just because you get your result, you get to catch it on Tuesday, but then you go live a regular life until when you get your negative results to say you didn't get, you did between getting the test and actually getting right. your results. That's also a possibility. Right. So also keep that and in mind. And then you have with to trust the- everybody else. You got to trust everybody else there. Mm-hmm. So let's say you got a cousin who y'all know, you know, girl, we ain't believe half of what she said. I really ain't Little got mixing. tested. Do we know she got tested? Right. 
Do do we know she got tested? Did her little boyfriend get tested? Which boyfriend she? You know how everybody got that one cousin, <laughs> always got a new man. You don't know. You know you don't. You don't know who she gonna show up with. We you know we don't know. Again, I just say this. I got some family I love to death. If they tell me they're getting tested, I need to see receipts. Right. I need to see some paperwork. Because I just know how they get. Okay. You at the hookah bar. I saw you on IG. I follow you on IG. You at the hookah bar on Monday. Okay. I saw you. Right. I know after exactly your test. where you were at. You were at the hookah bar on Monday after your test. Okay. That makes so me I saw you. a little more tend to do uh, more traveling because I was starting to get, I don't want to say like a false sense of security getting on a plane, but I was starting a little more worried going to a destination that required people to test um, before they arrived. I would also feel better if you had a test, um, like if you had a test before you got on the plane to go someplace and then needed to show or take another test through there, just like multiple tests yes. to, you know, make sure that that first test was good. Yes. And then if you could, a uh, secondary test, I'm right. kind of thinking or that you're going to move in safer yeah. ways than somebody that wouldn't like yes. you've been wearing, you've been keeping the distance, especially since yes. your last test. So that we feel a little bit That's better. Yeah, no, that I think that's a smart way to go. I mean, my job for the most part is remote. And right now, because of everything going on, we're not allowed to go on site at all. If mm. I wasn't in the middle of like building a house right now, I, I'll be honest, I would have packed up some masks and taken some tests and I would have just got an Airbnb in Costa Rica for a month. And I'll see y'all in the new year. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but um, but I, I do think that's the way to go. Like if you're going to do something, get tested before, a lot of times, a lot of these airports, now you can get tested again and you can get tested before you leave and just make sure you got a couple extra dollars. So if you do come up positive and you have to ride it out, you're not yeah. financially stranded, you know, yeah. um, you're not financially stranded someplace else. So I think that's important mm-hmm. um, right now. Another thing I wanted to mention though, before we, before we finish, because people ask sometimes like, well, after a vaccine is approved, like, like then what as far as safety? Um, this is another resource people can look at. So we have a national system that keeps track of the adverse events related to vaccines after they've been administered for years. And this system is something that you as an individual can actually report something to on your own. Um, it's called the VAERS system, and it's the vaccine adverse event um, like surveillance kind of thing. So that's something people can look up and learn more about if they want to. Say that um, one more time. Please. And then we have the V-S- V-A-E-R-S. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then we have the V-S-D. So the V-X-D is a vaccine safety data link. So this is how, let's say a researcher is like five years down the road. I'm getting a lot of patients who are coming in with, I'm going to make something up. Their, their, their big toe has, is now growing crooked. Like it's so weird. I'm trying to figure out what's going on, right? So in this database, they'll be able to search and say, oh, hold on a minute. So I had 100 people with this crooked toe and they all had which vaccine or they all had this this drug or whatever it is. But it allows you to then search and try Mm -hmm. to like find trends. You got what I'm saying? Yep. Um, That data, that data link is like eight different health systems connected for like a total like nine million patients but that's something that they use to sur- to be able to do surveillance so you okay. can go back in medical records and look right you can also project forward it's called um, rapid cycle analysis rca i think that's how they say it so it allows you to see if there's certain health conditions that are showing up at higher rates in certain populations in their particular group and so that is one of the things that is continuously done after the fact so when people say we don't know the safety they are correct we don't know the reality is this, and this is for any drug. If you're waiting for a full 20-year safety profile, no drug would ever be able to get approved. So the surveillance process for safety is something that has to continue after something is approved and administered. Because the reality is we couldn't wait long enough. Technically, you want a 100-year safety profile. Mm-hmm. We don't have 100 years. So. Yeah. It's just a reminder that the safety surveillance portion continues after something is approved. That's also the reason why you get multiple vaccines. We're talking about the polio one, right? How there's 
there's lots of polio vaccines. So over time, they got better with the vaccines. Right. And they were able to test old vaccine to new ones. They see this new one is better and it's safer. Get rid of the old one. And they continuously do that. And so that's how you have multiple versions of a polio vaccine mm-hmm. um, with better safety profiles today than they were in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 50s. You know, right. so, so that is what's going to continue to happen for this as well. Okay. <sighs> I feel like I know some things now on my job and be like, I know something. <laughs> Sit down. <laughs> Let me holler at you. The, but the thing seriously, I want, yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you know, there's a lot that is still left, you know, for mm-hmm. us to learn. There's still a whole lot we don't know about this at all. Um, and that's going to continue. Um, the thing I just want people to remember is, when people say, well, I'm concerned because they're not safe. I like to ask people, what do we define in their safe? Mm-hmm. Um, like, like you have to be able to tell me what that means because safety to me can mean something, you know, different to somebody else. And when you're looking at safety profile, you have to also look at the safety profile of actually going through a condition and an illness, no matter what it is. So when you're, you know, making your plans for yourself and your family, and as more of this studies come out, because we're going to see, listen, this, this whole, everybody's working on a vaccine. Yeah, they are. And with that being said, there are hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars now being thrown and everybody trying to get the goose that lays the golden egg. We're going to see companies that are going to go under if their vaccine doesn't work because they have put every last dime they could squeeze, you know, into the development of the vaccine. And statistically, majority of them won't won't be able to make it just based upon what we know about drug development right like getting through mm-hmm. the whole process um so when people hear oh they said this whenever you say they said take a look at what people are talking about go online and read the data for yourself the data is public clinicaltrials.gov is another resource for everybody if you ever want to know what clinical trials are being done legally in order to published results in the United States of America, you have to, it's not an option, you have to have your study listed on clinicaltrials.gov. The study has to include what are we studying, right? Has to include who's funding it, like what company is doing Mm. what, and it includes a list of all the locations participating in that trial. This is not an option. This is a legal requirement. I used to work at a hospital where my job was to make sure our records for clinicaltrials.gov were updated accordingly. Mm -hmm. If we got caught out of compliance, it can be up to an $11,000 fine per day until every single piece that is out of compliance is put back into compliance. So if anybody ever says, hey, you know, are they doing a trial for this? Go to clinicaltrials.gov. You can search by the issue or concern. You can search by your state. And you'll be able to see what study it is, what company is doing it, what it's about. And if you're interested, who can you call to ask questions? If people are dealing with a family member or themselves fighting a medical condition and are looking for more help or more options, this is a great place for you to go to as well. Um, You can search breast cancer, North Carolina, breast cancer, New York, whatever. But it's Mm -hmm. another place for you to have resources but in order for any data to be published in the United States of America for clinical trials, your trial has to be registered on clinicaltrials.gov. And that's, a, that's another just resource. Anybody can look in, and find what they need to find. And at least a contact person if they want to ask questions. That's a really good plug. Thank you for that. So, yeah, I mean, I don't feel like I, I usually say, so is there anything that you leave the people with? Well, I, mean, I feel like you like really... Um, <laughs> Tie that up. Nice. I mean, overall, I got a lot of really good information. So thank you so much for all of that. I know I have um, a basis to make a more and to make an informed decision now uh, outside yeah. of me and my, um, you know, rabbit yeah. hole mind. I at least now know. And it was really, as you can say, um, the most reassuring to know that we have seen COVID before it's been SARS and MERS and so that's why we're able this far ahead in coming up with a vaccine as well as having the the DNA I guess what is it the DNA 
so that mm-hmm. we actually know we how to- it's going to work with our so between knowing something and knowing more yeah. about our bodies we're able to kind of start in the middle as opposed you know all the way in the beginning that being said yeah go ahead we have the genetic code and we have we have some of the genetic code which is why we're able to kind of start where we are but we still have a long way to go the data that's being published is phase two data I don't get excited about phase two data. I need to see the whole shebang, you know? Um, I think a healthy dose of skepticism with, with just about everything is healthy and it's yeah. necessary because it allows you to fully vet things um, completely without getting caught in any particular echo chamber. For every person that's like pro-vaccine, um, I don't want to know just whatever, right? There's people who are anti-vaccine and sometimes on both sides, people don't really even fully understand why they think what they think. So, right. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, I was happy to come on here and just try to get some baseline information because no matter what it is you want to do, you need to be able to get out of your echo chamber and be able to answer fully with accurate information why you will why you won't what your concerns are what you need to see and I think that is healthy and fine um but making a decision for against anything this is vaccine or whatever based upon incomplete data or based upon what I feel like now which is good marketing and very bad Mm -hmm. science and that's for a whole lot of things Right. Because the marketing has gotten so great that it lets people think that they understand the science they're talking about and they don't. And it's hard sometimes to know the difference between the two, because as we know how algorithms work, it will show you the information that it knows you already want to see. Yeah. Um, to confirm, was it um, confirmatory bias to confirm whatever it is you want to believe. We know that's how algorithms work. And a lot of the things as it relates to vaccines and meat versus plants, a lot of that is just really good marketing that looks like really good science. And it makes it harder for all of us to make the right decision for ourselves and our family. I wouldn't care so much if it wasn't for the fact that we are our brother's keeper and that there are certain health conditions that impact people as a whole. And we all have a part to play in protecting one another. I wouldn't care so much if it was like, well, if you got it from licking a stamp, you can't spread it. It's all right, sis, go off. But that's just not the way that this works. Uh, And public health is called public health for a reason. So I just want everybody to be curious. I think that is normal. We all should be more curious. Mm -hmm. And anytime they say they, no matter who the they is, Go and read things for yourself. And if you don't understand them, because sometimes this information is hard to digest, then you can reach out and find other people who can help you understand other qualified people. Me personally, I know nothing about money. Like if you start talking about stocks and bonds and and investments, girl, my eyes, I don't know. So I have to go talk to the people who understand the money, right? Mm -hmm. To help me understand. Um, So I want everybody just to have what they need to make the best decision for themselves. It's not related to an anxiety induced decision, no matter which way that is. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I feel like a lot of us are put under a whole lot of pressure to make a move left or right. And that increased anxiety is not healthy and it clouds our judgment and it clouds our ability to vet what people are telling us and to really understand how this applies to me personally. So you can make the best decisions for yourself. Um, so if people have more questions, like particular questions, I can, if you like send them to me, whatever, Mm -hmm. I can try to get some information. Like, and I try, you know, I try to like leave with sources, give you some information where they can go look for it. And if I don't know, if I don't know, I know how to find the, the people who you're going to need to get those questions from. And then we can get, we can get answers. Um, I just want people to remember like COVID-19 is the tip of the iceberg. This is bigger to me than just COVID-19. We're going to, we're entering a different phase and it's going to be important that all of us really take our health very seriously um, because I want us all to be around to talk about how terrible this Thanksgiving was this time next year. You know, I want us all to be here to be able to do that. So where can the people find you, Dion? Oh, um, (laughs) I'm kind of like nowhere right now. People have like particular questions. If you just do an Instagram, like little question thing, 
mm-hmm. and we'll put another round of questions together and I can provide some more resources okay. people to look up and read. Um, but, but generally speaking, when, when anytime you hear somebody say, well, they said, or this study, go find the study. If it's an article worth this grain of salt, it's going to list the sources. Don't be afraid to copy the source in, in, the, in the footnotes, paste mm-hmm. it into Google and go see what it says. Because often studies are misquoted. They'll mm-hmm. say, well, this study said that. You'll really be like, that ain't what that said at all. So if it's worth this grain of salt, they're going to tell you exactly where they got the information from. You should not have to be searching, trying to find out who they are talking about. They should be able to tell you if it's worth this grain of salt, whether you agree with it or not the sources should be listed in the article that they're talking about. Ignore headlines. They are staged to sound a certain way to get you to be interested. And just remember right now, we are still in the preliminary phases of, of overall development. Phase two data has not come out yet. Um, I mean, phase three has not come out yet. Phase two data is out and that data is mostly public. You can read that for yourself. You can read all 184 pages of that Moderna vaccine. Um, And we will see more companies, you know, make some statements and publications over the next coming months about their own data and what they find out. Um, But that's all I got. Take Mm -hmm. care of yourself. Watch your stress because stress will kill you faster than anything else. And no matter what it is you want to do, resist the urge to buck the system in terms of I ain't scared, so I'm just going to go all out. No, there's a way to still enjoy your life and, and put caution in place so, right. you have a, so you have a balance, you know? So there's, there's a way you can still get some stuff done for yourself that you want to do and still move the most smartly way around it. I don't think that includes hookah bars, but- It don't. Personally, you know? It don't. it don't. I mean, at least do a strip club, so you can at least get some titty ass. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like if, like if you go, like all I'm gonna say is like if you gonna do it, listen. If someone <laughs> says, "Girl, how do I get sick?" Girl, I was busting it down in St. Lucia. At least St. Lucia was worth it. What I look like saying Myrtle Beach? What that sound like? That sound terrible. At least go bust it wide open in St. Lucia or something. You know what I'm saying? Like if you gonna do it. <laughs> I, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you're going to do it. You got to do it right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Listen, go to Aruba. <laughs> <laughs> if you guys have any questions. Don't do Myrtle Beach, Dion, y'all. Dion. <laughs> don't do Miami. Don't do my Myrtle Beach. Nah. Don't do it. Don't do Aruba. it. If you guys have any more questions for Dion, definitely shoot me. You can email me at dcarry at travelandshippodcast.com. I will definitely forward to her. Um. Or hit me on Instagram. You know how to find me. There will absolutely be links in the box to um, resources that Dion mentioned and hopefully some extra ones for you guys. And thanks for listening. I'll talk to you guys next week. And don't forget, though, travel is more than vacation. Boom. All right, y'all. Thank you. Bye, folks.